The existence of pathogens such as bacteria, viruses, and fungi was unsuspected. Almost no effective treatments existed for prevalent diseases until the 18th century. Until the late 1830s, the lack of effective anesthesia made the few common surgical procedures horribly painful and all others impossible. Between the 17th and 19th centuries, medicine in the United States reflected a narrowly limited understanding of disease and a rather cursory training of medical practitioners. Public health institutions were few, feeble, and ephemeral, rising momentarily with epidemics of yellow fever or smallpox, and subsiding from neglect after the crisis resolved. Even the simplest public health measures, hand-washing and antiseptic techniques, clean water, sound, pathogen-free housing, an untainted food supply, sewage management, and quantitative disease reporting were all in the future. Because there were only a few effective disease therapies and no antibiotics, epidemics of yellow fever, malaria, tuberculosis, and other infectious diseases frequently raged unchecked. In the early 1700s, This mirrored the situation in England and the rest of Europe. But medicine on the continent began to undergo modernizing changes, although these were very slow to cross the Atlantic. Europe began to embrace public health measures and medical advances, such as widespread vaccination, scientific medical education, and the rise of the hospital. But American progress lagged behind, especially in the insular south. The point of this chapter's unflattering precy of nascent American medicine is not to castigate it for its primitivism, but to put blacks' historical aversion to medical care into context, for most antebellum blacks were subjected to southern medicine. The South was a particularly unhealthy region and was home to 90% of American blacks, the majority of whom were enslaved until 1865. The first blacks arrived in the colonies in 1619, and by 1700 there were only about 20,000 blacks. But as the slave trade flourished, 20,000 more blacks arrived each year. Although 30% of transported slaves died in the nightmare of the Middle Passage, there were 550,000 chattel slaves in the United States by 1776, when blacks constituted 20% of the U.S. population. By 1807, slave importation was legally prohibited throughout the country, and by 1860, the nation's four million enslaved blacks had a value equivalent to four billion dollars today. In some states, the black population completely comprised slaves. Alabama, for example, forbade the presence of free blacks. The South was the nadir of the American medical experience, visited by a deadly triple confluence, the pathogens of North America, Europe, and Africa. This unholy trinity yielded a bewildering array of unfamiliar infectious diseases, such as hookworm, types of malaria, and yellow fever, incubated by a subtropical climate that was hospitable year-round to pathogens that could not thrive in the colder north. Even familiar European illnesses flared anew in strangely virulent forms, abetted by the hot, marshy climate, poor sanitation, and a public health vacuum. Although the South harbored a highly visible affluent class, the region's relative poverty led to a dearth of medical care and a host of unrecognized nutritional deficiency diseases. So did enslavement. A dramatically misunderstood set of disease etiologies led to the adoption of heroic remedies calculated to kill or cure. Through the 18th century, Western medicine was not only misinformed, but dangerously so. Caustic medicines of the period often contained metabolic poisons such as arsenic or calomel, a compound of mercury and chlorine that was used as a purgative, Many other remedies contained highly toxic substances, such as mercury and addictive Schedule II narcotics, including the opiates laudanum, opium.